I can now quote again from one of my favorite institutions in whole of Washington. It's a quote from the uh, Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board. <laughs> Their motto is, weed them and reap, remove noxious weeds, protect our resources. So here it goes. Garlic mustard's vegetative growth starts early in the spring outcompeting native and beneficial species that are still dormant. Its ability to reproduce high quantities of seed from a single plant can make it difficult to eradicate once it is well established. Seeds can survive a number of years in the seed bank, prolonging its ability to dominate a site. A garlic mustard also changes the composition of a plant community by exuding chemicals that disrupt plant growth in certain plant myrcorrhizal fungi connections, which are important for tree seedling health. There you go. <laughs> there are other uh, variations of mustard as well, and mustard is not just an evasive speed, but it also has a lot of benefits. It Tastes good, for one. No bratwurst should be without it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a cliché German who likes bratwurst, beer, and sauerkraut. All of three in combination are also like the kingdom of God. <laughs> it's an actual quote from St. Paul's letter to the Teutonic tribes. <laughs> he planned to write that, but he didn't get around it, but it's a sentiment that counts. So, mustard is known since time immemorial. Greeks and Romans used it both for medicinal and culinary properties. People in Asia use it as well as people in Northern Europe. Mustard also shows up in many religious texts. It's the Buddha talks about it, it's mentioned in the Holy Quran, and it also shows up in Hindu texts. However, in Jesus' time, the mustard seed is an undesirable plant in every garden. At the beginning, I read, of course, from the publication of the Noxious Weed Control Board, but the concerns about the invasive properties of mustard are nothing new. Jewish law prohibits planting mustard in the garden because of these invasive qualities. Pliny the Elder, in his Natural History, published around AD 78, writes, Mustard... Once it has been sown, it is scarcely possible to get the place free of it as a seed when it falls germinates at once. And Dominic Crossan writes, even when one de de deliberately cultivates a domesticated mustard seed for its medicinal or culinary properties, there is an ever-present danger that it will destroy the garden. The mustard plant is as dom domesticated in the garden, dangerous and deadly, end quote. Mustard grows in the garden until there is no garden left but only mustard. So basically, mustard seed is a device that blows up the garden like a bomb, only it has a time fuse. You throw it on the ground, and then you can count the days until the garden is history. Of course, Jesus uh, uses this mustard seed as a metaphor. The face is like a mustard seed. It is very small, it becomes very big. It also destroys the well-ordered garden of the Jewish elites, who set up the garden in a way that produces the fruits they want. The temple elites in Jerusalem are collaborators. They basically run the country for the Romans. And the Roman procurator resides in Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast, and as long as the taxes keep flowing and the country is relatively quiet, he leaves them be. The temple elites keep the Roman requirement of being obedient taxpayers and the Jewish desire for national autonomy in balance. And that's difficult because most Jews, Jews hope for a divinely ordained savior figure who will kick the Romans out. And sometimes the crowds get carried away with enthusiasm and someone says, it's me, and calls for revolution. The two people who are crucified with Jesus are bandits. That's a translation of a Greek term that does not describe criminals like thieves, but armed insurrectionists. They, of course, rob people too to fund the struggle. 
It is important to keep in mind that there is no separation between religion and state or politics or anything else. Everything is also religious. Jewish nationhood is a deeply religious concept. And as soon as it gets religious, things can get crazy. Jesus, for instance, disrupts the delicate balance of giving space for radical messianic hopes and assuring the Romans that there is no one challenging Roman power. There is something real at stake here. If Roman power is challenged, Rome always responds with steel. The Pax Romana is a piece of the graveyard. You get in line or you die. A couple of Passovers before Jesus is crucified, Pilate executes 3,000 uh, Jews to make it crystal clear who is in charge. But defeating rebellion costs money. Uh, when the Romans have to spend money by on sending the legions to enforce Roman peace, they might get the idea they may need more reliable collaborators, and so they dispose of the old ones. For instance, before Judea was ruled by a Roman procurator, it was ruled by a king, Herod Archelaus, one of the sons of Herod the Great. Herod called all his sons Herod, that's why it's so hard to tell them apart. <laughs> but this Herod could not keep the peace, and then the Senate in Rome had enough and deposed him and installed a procurator, and they exiled Archelaus to Vienna. And that was a barbarian hovel at the time, and no Roman client king wants to end up there. It's their equivalent of Guantanamo Bay. The Jewish elites base their power on the control of the temple. With the temple, they control access to God. What Jesus is saying with this metaphor is that Jesus is not a weed they can get rid of. Instead, Jesus will destroy their garden, their business model, how things are done in Judea. And at the time, the Jewish idea of salvation is not individual, a reward for good behavior. But in Jewish thought of the first century, salvation is communal. God punishes the people for unfaithfulness by sending the Romans or the Babylonians or the Assyrians or the Egyptians, Moabites, Ammonites, everybody who has an army can be used by God as an agent of God's wrath. And when the Israelites or later the Jews have suffered enough, God kicks the occupying army out again. And that is the basic movement they see repeated in their history since the days of the patriarchs. Punishment, suffering like exile or occupation, and then restoration. For the Jewish people, that cycle never really stopped. They have suffered a lot, especially since Judaism and Christianity drifted apart and a profound antagonism developed between the two. For most of Western history, anti-Jewish sentiments grew and resulted in countless bloodlettings by self-appointed agents of wrath, crowned by the Nazis to wipe the Jewish people on the face of the earth. There are Jewish groups that see the Shoah as divine punishment for unfaithfulness. I see it as German unfaithfulness to the basic tenets of civilization. It was murderous as well as suicidal. The Germans of Jewish faith were a huge factor in what made Germany great. Scientists, writers, artists, and thinkers. And the Nazis ripped the beating heart out of the body of the nation. And what was left after the war was a collective amnesia. Nobody knew anything. Hitler never knew the guy. Without Germans of Jewish faith, Germany became a stuffy republic in which mediocrity ran supreme. But whenever times are dark, God uses strange angels to cast a ray of light into the darkness and keep the hope alive. One of these strange angels was Oskar Schindler. He was no hero material. He was an opportunist who was ready to sell his soul for money. And even though he was as corrupt as he could possibly be, he was always bankrupt. 
He was a person you would tell your children and everybody else you know to stay away from. Don't touch that Schindler guy with a 10-foot pole. Even those who owed him his life and loved him dearly for it admitted after the war that he was a scoundrel and a hedonist who was after fast money. But he had a mustard seed moment when he defied the death-dealing purposes of the Nazis and saved the Jews who came into his care. He acquired an animal factory in German-occupied Poland. He employed the cheapest labor possible, Jews from the concentration camp, to produce something that was supposedly absolutely vital for the war effort. I don't know how you win a war with animal wear, but Schindler handed out bribes like candy and until his stuff was as vital as ammunition. The Nazis, and especially the SS, were not just morally corrupt. They made organized crime look like helpless neophytes. He entertained those in power. He drank, he partied, he gambled, he hired prostitutes, while some of his Jews managed the actual business. Schindler could drink Nazis under the table, but he could not manage his way out of a paper bag, much less manage a business. And when it was clear that the war was lost and the Red Army was on the offensive, the Nazis, and especially the SS, wanted to kill as many Jews as possible until the horror was over. Schindler convinced Amon Goethe, the incarnate evil, the commandant of the concentration camp Krakow Plasov, to relocate his factory to the West. And that was when they taped, uh, typed up the famous list that held the names of those Jews that would move with the factory. And when there was a bureaucratic mix-up and his workers were sent to Auschwitz, he went there and he got them back. A whole trainload full of them. Those on Schindler's list survived the war. And when the war was over, Schindler tried many things and failed in all of them. He lost all his riches, and then he lost every penny anyone ever gave him. He lived from the donations of those he saved. And one of them was interviewed, and a journalist asked him if they were all able to fulfill Oskar Schindler's needs. And he laughed and answered, fulfilling Schindler's needs means robbing the World Bank. Oskar Schindler died in 1974, and he's buried in Israel, right across from the Temple Mount, first in line for the resurrection that some Jews think will start from there. The Jews that save, uh, Schindler saved were fruitful and multiplied. They blew the garden of death apart and filled the world with new Jewish life. Schindler may not be the average hero, but you only have to drop one seed of life to defeat death. Amen.